Hi there, you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. This is actually the second time that I've uploaded this video on the disappearance of Joan Reesh. I had a technical issue with the first upload, uh, so I've had to upload it again. Apologies for any inconvenience. There were a couple of likes to the video and also two comments uh, when this error occurred. Thank you to everybody who commented. They were fascinating comments that I'm actually going to mention in this re-recording of the video. Thank you all, in fact, for your fascinating comments and insights across all of my videos. I really appreciate it. So let's get started. On October the 24th in 1961, police were called to a house in Lincoln, Massachusetts, from which a 31-year-old woman called Joan Reesh vanished without a trace. Joan lived in the house pictured in the centre with her two children, a son called David, aged two, and a daughter, Lillian, aged four, as well as her husband, Martin Reich, aged 34. Joan is pictured on the left there with her two children, and we also see her on the right, smiling and happy. By the time the police reached the house on October 24th, all that remained of Joan was a pool of blood, which was later identified as type O, the same blood type as Joan's. Joan has never been seen since and is missing over 60 years. Joan's husband, Martin, would remain in the house until 1975, when the Minuteman National Memorial Park acquired back the land. He then relocated to Lexington. During the period he remained in the house, he never changed his telephone number, hoping that Joan would one day ring. He would never remarry. He also never had his wife declared dead. It was clear that Martin loved his wife dearly and that he hoped she would return. Martin died after a long illness, age 79, never knowing what happened to his wife. In this video, I would like to put forward a theory as to what I feel happened to Joan. So let's get started. So this was the scene that greeted the Lincoln police when they arrived to Joan's house that day. You can see there's some blood there in the centre of the kitchen. Um, it looked like a lot of blood, but in actual fact, it would transpire that the Harvard Medical Lab estimated that it was probably most likely about half a pint. Um, there was an attempt to clean the blood up. You can see some kitchen roll there. Um, and the blood was typo, which matched uh, Joan's uh, blood. Uh, you can see on the left there the bin, and in the bin was the telephone. You can see the cord just sticking out there. The phone had actually been ripped from the wall, um, and there are some beer cans in the bin, which weren't recognisable to Martin. Um, Joan and he didn't routinely drink beer. Uh, there was some forensic evidence there. Uh, there were three fingerprints that didn't belong to anybody in the house. Uh, there was a bloody palm print and in actual fact, the police force would go on and check about 10,000 uh, fingerprints. There were a number of police forces involved in this investigation. There was the Lincoln Police, the Massachusetts State Police and also the FBI, but they never found a match for those uh, fingerprints. Uh, so a very bizarre uh, scene, you know, it looked as if, you know, Joan had attempted to clean up the scene with kitchen roll that, that, that you can see there in the photos. So a very strange scene. Mike McHugh, the lead detective for the Lincoln Police, his immediate instinct was that there had been a suicide. But of course, when he went throughout the house, he never found Joan's body. And we know that Joan has been missing for over 60 years. So then they started to ask, well, what could have transpired in the house on that day? So this is the kitchen from another angle. We can see a blood smear on the wall that was also blood type O. In fact, the only blood found at the scene was blood type O. There were also droplets of blood uh, in the master bedroom and also around David's crib in his room. There was also blood type O on Joan's car, on the boot of the car and uh, some other uh, parts of the car. Um, you can see that a, a table was knocked over. Um, 
the phone book was actually on the counter of the kitchen. It was open at the emergency number page, which was blank. Uh, Jonah Martin had just moved to Lincoln in April 1961. This was now October 1961 when Joan's vanishing took place. Perhaps they just hadn't got around to finishing off some of the jobs that can take quite a few months to do when you when you move house. Um, so the police figured that suicide perhaps was looking less likely and that it was looking more like perhaps Joan had had some sort of medical emergency, maybe a miscarriage. Uh, she went to get the number from the directory for emergency help, went to ring for help, maybe got dizzy, fell backwards, pulling the phone out of the wall, or because fingerprints were found in the house and also there was the bloody palm print by the phone, uh, she was attacked. Um, she tried to ring for help and um, the phone was uh, pulled out of the wall by an attacker. In those days, there wasn't a 911 number. So uh, that added to the sort of, I guess, uh, gravity of the situation as well. Um, another challenge for the police was to actually figure out what was the sequence of events so because blood was found on the bonnet of Joan's car did she have some kind of medical emergency outside or was she attacked outside and then came into the house to ring for help or vice versa um you know was she attacked in the house uh, in the kitchen or the bedrooms um and she left the house to get help or perhaps was taken against her will or perhaps she willingly drove off in another vehicle with somebody or it, there were just so many potential scenarios um, that it just made the investigation so much more complex. And I think that's why the case has held such interest and, um, you know, captivation for so many years for people who work in the police force and also for web sleuths because there are just so many potential uh, scenarios. A police dog was actually brought to the scene, but the police dog didn't pick up Joan's scent beyond the car, her own car in the driveway. Uh, there was no scent of her on the roadways or the woods or in the you know, uh, area leading into the woods behind her house. Um, no scent, no forensic evidence whatsoever. Uh, the only scent that was picked up was in terms of the route that she normally took to her neighbour's house, Barbara Barker. They normally helped each other out with the uh, child minding. So it would suggest that possibly Joan left in a vehicle, either willingly or against her will. Um, so that too, the, the police dog, uh, you know, that all added to the mystery as well. So it was just a, a completely mysterious uh, an enigmatic uh, scene uh, uh, and remains as enigmatic and as elusive as ever because, you know, the crime, um, if there was a crime or the disappearance of it was a willing disappearance, you know, the whole story, the whole scenario remains unsolved for over 60 years. So let's go back to the morning of October 24th. Martin had taken a flight from Logan Airport at 8 a.m. for a business trip in Manhattan, which would require him to be away from home for a couple of nights. Police did speculate that perhaps, uh, you know, family members or neighbours or friends knew that Joan was going to be alone. It wasn't uncommon for Martin with his work to, to be away from home. Martin was a sales executive for the Fitchburg Paper Company with responsibility for the New England area. He was attending a conference in Manhattan on that day. It was not unusual for wives in Lincoln, a prosperous suburb outside of Boston with a population of 4,000, to be alone midweek whilst their husbands were on business in New York and other parts of the country. Martin himself could be away on five night stretches at a time. Joan ran some errands that morning after Martin left. First, she left David with Barbara Barker, her neighbour across the road. They had a reciprocal child-minding relationship in which they helped each other out. Joan would also mind Barbara's son, Douglas, who was the same age as Lillian. Joan had a filling done at the dentist in Bedford that morning on the recommendation of her good friend uh, Sabine Morton who she went to college with and who lived just half an hour away. Uh, Sabine had mentioned um, this dentist to uh, Joan because she was new to the area. Um, Joan would then stop off at a department store with Lillian on the way home. 
and she then picked up some groceries and finally she popped to Barbara Barker's house to collect David. Joan was now back at the house and between 11.15 and 11.45 a.m. a delivery driver for a dry cleaners company arrived at the house to collect some of Martin's suits. He would tell the Lincoln police that he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary that morning. Joan seemed perfectly fine. Equally, a milkman and a postman that had called to the house that day were interviewed by the Lincoln police and they also said that everything appeared as normal. Joan put David down for his nap at 12 p.m. He napped daily from 12 p.m. until 2 p.m. In the meantime, Barbara Barker dropped Douglas, her son, over to Joan's house and he and Lillian uh, played in the garden outside while Joan attended to some chores. So at about 1 p.m., Barbara Barker looked out the window and she saw uh, Joan mowing the lawn. Um, in other accounts, Joan is described as having the garden shears out and that she's pruning. In Stephen J. Ahern's excellent book about the Joan Reach case, and I highly recommend it, it's a brilliant read and it's meticulously researched. The book says that when the police arrived after Joan disappeared, they found the garden uh, lawnmower uh, unused. It didn't look as if it had been taken out at all, whereas they did find the garden shears and they found plant cuttings. So this seemed to be the more uh, likely explanation of what she was doing, that she had been doing some pruning. One thing is for certain is that Joan had been doing some gardening at about 1 p.m. Uh, onwards. By the way, Stephen J. Hearn's excellent book on the Joan Reach case is, is, is called A Kitchen Painted in Blood. It's superb. It's so well researched. I, I highly recommend it. At 1.55 p.m., Joan popped Lillian and Douglas back over to Barbara's house to play. Uh, she took them over to the swing set, also bringing Lillian's tricycle. She didn't tell Barbara that she had dropped the children to the swing set. Now, it's hard to know whether that was just regular behaviour between the two women. They knew each other's routines very well, or was it a sign that maybe Joan was feeling unwell, didn't have the strength or the energy to tell Barbara, or maybe somebody menacing had arrived at the house and she wanted to get the children to safety. Um, it's just something to consider. At 2.15, Barbara Barker saw Joan from the window of her house. Joan was in the driveway near her car. She appeared dazed. Her arms were outstretched and she seemed to be holding something red. Barbara wondered if Joan was maybe running after David. Joan was never seen again after this point. This was effectively the last sighting of Joan. Um, about 3.40 p.m., Barbara walked Lillian back over to her mother's house, to Joan's house, as she had a couple of errands she wanted to do. She wanted to go shopping, etc. Uh, she did go in, assuming that Joan was there. So perhaps, you know, this was a usual behaviour between both women. Lillian would go inside and she would play for a while. Um, the kitchen was obviously covered in blood. And then David would start to cry in his crib. Uh, he was probably hungry at this point. So Lillian ran back over to Barbara's house and she would tell Barbara that the kitchen was painted uh, with red paint and that mummy had disappeared. Uh, Barbara went back over to Joan's house, bringing Lillian with her. And of course, uh, when she went inside, she instantly saw, you know, the scene of you know, blood and, and uh, you know, the table knocked over, etc. And she rang the Lincoln police. Uh, she could clearly see she checked all the rooms that um, Joan, you know, had vanished. Before Barbara Baxter returned Lillian to the house, Virginia Keane, the daughter of the Risha's neighbour, would see an unfamiliar and dirty car parked behind Joan's car in the driveway at about 3.30 p.m. She thought it was a greyish blue 1954 Plymouth vehicle, two-tone and dirty. She spotted it as she got off the school bus. She recognised it as not being one of the vehicles that Joan or Martin drove. She thought that it might have been a Massachusetts number plate. Shortly after this, another local resident, Hilda Seigler, would see a similar car pulling out of a driveway that she thought was Risha's driveway, though she couldn't be 100%. The car was headed to Route 2A. 
And Martin's regular milkman, Bernard Socket, who had been on holiday uh, when Joan vanished, he stated that he had seen a car a couple of days before Joan disappeared that matched the description that Virginia gave. Uh, this car was in the driveway between 9.30 and 10 a.m. But Joan and Martin's car, uh, each of their cars were not in the driveway. Uh, is it possible that uh, Joan's house was being staked out before she disappeared? A nearby neighbour said that a few days before Joan disappeared, she would hear her garage door opening and closing during the night. Joan's entire house could be viewed from the garage. There was another witness in relation to the mysterious vehicle. Ed Corsetti, a reporter with the Boston Record America, received an anonymous tip off. The person who gave the tip reported to Ed that he also saw the mysterious car in the driveway. He remembered some of the letters and numbers in its number plate. Ed passed this tip on to the police. After extensive investigative work, the police would narrow down 1,100 vehicles, eventually identifying a car which was stolen and belonged to a Medford man. But when they searched this vehicle, they could no find no forensic evidence that linked it to Joan. The police weren't fully satisfied that, you know, they had definitely hit on the right car. So they were still checking out cars into 1962 with the registration plates that started with P94. Douglas, Barbara Baxter's son, would say that he had seen a man wearing a suit in the house on the day that Joan disappeared. How reliable Douglas' sighting was, we will never know. He was aged just four years of age. One thing is for certain is that by the time Barbara dropped Lillian back to Joan's house that day at 3.40 p.m., she had just missed this mysterious vehicle by approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Was it possible that Joan left in this vehicle either willingly or was taken against her will and perhaps was even in the boot of the vehicle? Uh, it's a chilling consideration. So this wasn't the first tragedy to befall Joan. Uh, Joan was born in 1930 in Brooklyn. Her full name was Joan Carolyn Bard. Uh, when she was only eight years old, her parents would die in a suspicious fire. Her father was actually found clutching the telephone receiver as if he'd been attempting to call for help, which is ironic given the circumstances uh, that Joan left behind with the phone pulled out from the wall and the emergency number, uh, the page of the emergency number in the telephone directory open on the kitchen counter. Uh, so very, very uh, strange, you know, um, coincidence there. Um, Joan would be adopted by Alice, um, her mother's aunt, uh, and uh, her husband, Frank Natras. Now they had three children already. They had Frank Peter, uh, known as Peter, he was age seven. They had uh, Ben, who was age six. And they also had David, who was age four. They would go on to have a girl called Evelyn. So Joan's whole life changed. She went from being an only child, uh, to being an orphan, to being a foster child, to being an adopted child, to then at age 10, you know, being the eldest child uh, with three younger brothers. Now, Frank always resented Joan. She was an incredibly academic child, very bright, very precocious. Um, he had a good paying job, a steady job, and he gave it up to go into the music publishing industry. He had had some success with a song called I Am The Son Of A Legionnaire. Um, the business didn't succeed and it plunged the family into financial hardship. He would live off quite a substantial inheritance from his father for a while. And when that ran out, uh, he leaned on his sister, Grace, uh, who helped to support the family. Eventually, Grace would go on to have a stroke. She would be admitted to a healthcare facility and her attorney uh, would divert funds away from Frank towards her health care. In fact, when the police interviewed Frank about Joan's disappearance, he would say that the attorney had also instructed him to sell his car, um, you know, for the purposes of, of, of those funds being diverted to Grace. Now, there's something about this that I, I, I just find odd. Would an attorney leave somebody, you know, without a vehicle? Um, just seems odd. And of course, the red flag goes up because you think, um, 
could Frank have harmed Joan? Um, you know, uh, it's not uncommon after murder for people to dispose of a vehicle, um, to sell a vehicle, etc. So it's just something to think about. I will, uh, I will revisit the topic of Frank's car, which was also Plymouth, by the way, uh, later in the video. So the family, the children, they all grew up together. They matured together. They became adults together. Um, Joan was devoted to Alice, but Frank was a completely different proposition. He was a very difficult, narcissistic, bad-tempered man. Um, he expected everything to be done for him instantly at the click of, you know, his fingers. He would fly into rages, uh, you know, etc. So the family tiptoed around him and this went on for years and it was actually exacerbated by financial hardship, etc. And eventually Alice would leave and she would take Evelyn with her and David, the next child up from Evelyn, would also follow. They went to Los Angeles where Peter was working. Now, Frank was devastated. He was in New York. Uh, Grace was in a nursing home. His wife was gone. He was penniless. Um, and he was writing letters to Alice, imploring her to go home. Now, Ben, uh, the second eldest boy, uh, was very similar in temperament to Frank. And for that reason, Joan didn't like him very much. He, he couldn't look after his family. Uh, he was volatile. He was hot tempered. Now, he had been living in San Francisco. He got a payout from a car accident. He took his wife and five children. Ben had had a lot of children young and uh, Joan felt that he was sort of reckless and foolish and he couldn't support his family in San Francisco and he came back to New York. So now we have a situation where we have Frank and Ben uh, both without, you know, their children, their wife. Uh, when Ben returned to New York, his wife and children would go to live with her family in Long Island. Um, money was tight. Ben was working as a barman, but still things were very tight. Uh, at times, Alice was almost close to returning. But three weeks before Joan disappeared, she wrote a letter to uh, Alice, letting her know that Frank had sexually molested her. And this um, galvanized um, uh, Alice not to return to Frank. Um, Joan was concerned that if she returned with Evelyn, the same thing could happen to Evelyn. So here we see a really caring side, you know, of Joan. She was trying to protect Alice. She was trying to protect Evelyn. Um, you know, she confided to close friends and to Martin about the sexual molestation and also to her aunt Florence as well. Uh, so, you know, can you just imagine, you know, losing your parents in a fire, then being sexually molested and then one day disappearing, you know, and she may have been the victim of an attacker. It's a lot of bad luck for one person. You know, it, it really, truly is. So Alice held firm and she decided not to return. Despite the trials and tribulations of Joan's life, she had lost her parents when she was only eight in a suspicious fire. Um, you know, she had been sexually molested by her adoptive father, Frank. Uh, Joan battled on. Uh, she would actually win a scholarship to a prestigious university. It's Wilson College in Pennsylvania. We see her there in the newspaper article on the right, a very beautiful woman. And there's a description of her winning this scholarship. So that was an incredible achievement. Her close friend, Sabine Morton, would say that uh, you know, Joan was inspirational when they were at college that, you know, she worked five hours a day as a waitress because she needed the money. Uh, but she would, you know, still consistently score top marks in her assignments, etc. But most importantly, Joan was a good person. You know, it must have been so difficult for her to write to her aunt Alice in Los Angeles, who was also her adoptive mother. Alice adopted her, uh, brought her up in her home to let her know about the sexual molestation. She did this a few weeks before she disappeared, Joan. And she wanted to protect Alice and protect her adoptive sister, Evelyn. And that must have been, you know, a really big deal for her to do that. And it just shows what a caring heart she had. After graduating, Joan secured a job in Harcourt Brace, a huge international publishing company as a secretary. And she would eventually go on to work as an editorial assistant in the company. She would also go on eventually to work at Thomas W. Crowell, another huge uh, publishing company. So Joan was an enormously talented and clever woman.
Joan would now meet Martin at a football match. She was working and she was living a more carefree life. Um, you know, she had more peace of mind and the world was opening up to her. Joan and Martin had a lot in common. They were both from Brooklyn originally. Martin had also lost a parent when he was a young boy. So they both had that common experience, you know, of, of loss. They were both extremely smart. Uh, Martin was a master's graduate of Harvard Business School. Joan and Martin were both reserved, but they had close friends. Joan's uh, aunt, Florence Bard, would say that they were incredibly close couples. She once observed them walking, you know, down the street, uh, linking arms. They were always, you know, linking arms and really enjoyed each other's company. They loved to engage in intellectual debates with each other and they invariably held opposing opinions and positions, but their debates were never nasty and never antagonistic. So after they got married, they were literally like two peas in a pod. They settled in Ridgeford, Connecticut initially, eventually moving to Lincoln, Massachusetts. They had just moved there in April 1961, as I mentioned, so they were still getting to know their neighbours. Joan loved to visit the library there, and she was also active in the Women League of Voters. Sabine Morton, her close friend from college, lived just a half an hour drive away. Uh, so... Joan's life was, you know, really coming together. A lot of, um, you know, video content about Joan Reish portrays her as being a kind of restless and unfulfilled person, you know, because she left work to look after her children after having this successful career in publishing. But she did plan to return to be a teacher when they were a little bit older. So I don't think that Joan felt like her life was over, that she would never revisit her ambitions. I think that she knew that, you know, this period of child rearing, um, you know, was temporary. And, and all those who knew her said that she loved it. She really enjoyed it. Um, when the Lincoln police interviewed the dentist and her obstetrician who had delivered David, they said that she was an incredibly good humoured woman. They saw nothing that would have indicated, you know, that there was anything wrong with her or that she was troubled or unhappy. Uh, she was devoted to her children and um, that she was very much, you know, the opposite of what a lot of video content says about Joan. Uh, you know, she was very, very fulfilled and very content. I think there's maybe an assumption that because she was intellectual, uh, she wasn't, you know, content with this, you know, break or hiatus that she was having from her career. But as I said, she she knew that this was temporary and that she would definitely go on and do amazing things as a teacher. Now settled in Lincoln with a man that she loved and her close friend Sabine Morton just a uh, half half an hour drive away with supportive neighbours and two lovely children, Joan had survived her traumatic childhood and by all those who knew her was described as being a contented and devoted mother. Um, her uh, uh, adoptive mother, Alice, was also now separated and living a new life in Los Angeles. She had also, uh, you know, broken free of Frank. Joan had broken free of Frank. In fact, both women were now free. Joan was more fortunate in some ways uh, in comparison to, let's say, Alice, because uh, Martin earned the equivalent of 130,000 euros per year. This enabled Joan to stay home with her kids, even if it was just for a few years. Uh, she once told a business associate at a dinner, uh, a business associate uh, uh, of Martin's, that, that she couldn't bear to be away from her kids for even one night. So again, this makes you wonder, would Joan have run away voluntarily and left her kids? Uh, all those who knew her really well and all those that were close to her, such as Sabine and Martin, said that she was utterly devoted to her children and she would never have abandoned them. After Joan disappeared, there were a number of sightings of a woman who matched her description around Lincoln. At 2.45 p.m., a woman matching Joan's description wearing a grey coat, the grey coat was missing from her house, with a sort of handkerchief tied over her head, a white handkerchief, and walk, walking in a, a sort of dazed fashion, looking almost as if she was cold and shivery, uh, was walking along Route 2A. Now, this was about three miles from uh, 
Joan's home. So one wonders, uh, you know, if Barbara saw Joan out through the window at 2.15, which she said she did, how would Joan have traveled that distance in that amount of time? Equally, Martin said that she never wore scarves either on her head, never. Um, so a similarly dressed woman was again seen on Route 128 at 3.15 uh, uh, p.m. She was disoriented and cradling her stomach. And again, uh, another woman fitting uh, Joan's description was seen on Route 128 at around 4.30 p.m. with blood running down her legs or mud uh, running down her legs. The witness couldn't be entirely sure. A taxi driver would also later report that he picked up a disoriented woman at the Harvard Bridge who didn't know really where she wanted to go. She was giving him money from a brown paper bag. A Bedford hotel would also say that a disorientated woman had attempted to check into a hotel. She had no luggage, but it would later emerge that the woman who attempted to check into the hotel was a, an outpatient of a psychiatric unit. She was also a smoker, which Joan wasn't. There may have been a possibility that this woman uh, was also the woman in the taxi. So now I'd like to explore some potential theories as to what I feel may have happened to Joan. So could Joan have had some sort of medical emergency? Perhaps she had a spontaneous miscarriage, became dazed, uh, tried to ring for help, um, became very weak, fell back, sustained some kind of head injury, pulling the phone out from the wall uh, as she fell back. It's certainly a possibility could she maybe have just had a brain hemorrhage from the outset and there was no miscarriage again she went to ring for help became dazed and pulled the phone out from the wall as she fell back it's certainly a possibility uh, one thing that i do want to mention is a very popular theory about joan's disappearance is that she had an abortion that went wrong that an abortionist came to the house uh, she started to bleed very heavily he murdered her to cover up um, the abortion I just don't buy this theory. I think Joan was a very pragmatic, intelligent, organized woman. I just can't imagine her having an abortion to the house as her child was about to wake up from, from a nap or, you know, while Lillian was playing across the road and could come back at any point or Barbara could come back to the house at any point. Um, I just really don't buy this theory. Um, the theory is also predicated on the idea that maybe, you know, Joan wouldn't have liked to be pregnant with a third child by Martin. She was anxious to get back to work. I think there's, again, a lot of stereotypes that, you know, an intellectual woman, you know, is is eternally frustrated if she isn't in the workforce. I, I don't see any evidence of this. Everybody said that Joan really enjoyed her children. She might have been thrilled to pieces to be pregnant again, but I think she had faced far worse tribulations and and, and traumas in her life. I think she would have handled it with the same, you know, sort of calmness that she handled everything in her life uh, and positive attitude. So I, I just don't buy this theory that she would have had an abortion at the house. And there is also speculation, could she have had an affair? And uh, for this reason, she was trying to abort the child that, you know, she had born because of this relationship. But you know, Jonah just moved there in April and all the evidence shows that she was very contented with Martin. Um, I really don't buy this theory. And again, I think there's a lot of stereotypes around the frustrated housewife and she must have been so bored and lonely that she had an affair. There's a lot of, I think, stereotypes projected onto Joan's story and there just is really no factual evidence to, to back it up at all. So something else to consider is that Joan actually had dental work done the morning that she disappeared. Um, there is an old wife's tale, if you like, that it's not good to get dental work done when you are pregnant. Um, and I actually did a Google search and you can see that there are some academic articles there from dentistry journals, etc. And they actually say that the opposite is true, that poor gum health actually, in fact, can induce miscarriages. Having said all that, if you look further down the page there on the Google search, you can see that a dentist is giving some advice to pregnant women on what they can expect when they are having uh, dental treatment. And if you go into some dentist sites, uh, some of them do advise postponing 
sort of major dental work, etc. Um, until, you know, after the end of your pregnancy, particularly if it's a high risk pregnancy. Now, we know that Joan had a feeling that morning, but having said all that, feelings can be quite uncomfortable and uh, it's just something to consider. We then have to remember that Joan came home that morning and that she did very vigorous gardening. She was pruning, she was cutting, um, you know, some of the plants in her garden using shears, etc. In some accounts, it says that Barbara saw her mowing the lawn. So again, a very strenuous activity. And I actually did a Google search here. And there's actually, again, advice for women on how to garden safely when they're pregnant, because as we know, gardening can involve heavy lifting or the lifting of equipment or using heavy mown lawns, excuse me. And, um, you know, if we combine that with the dental treatment that Joan had that morning, could that have induced a spontaneous miscarriage? Perhaps she wasn't even aware that she was pregnant. So it's just something uh, to consider. And we can see that gardening is something that is a concern for pregnant women. Here's a, a, a question on trimester talk asking, can a pregnant woman cut the grass or mow the lawn? You know, so uh, uh, and that's because of its vigorous nature. And actually, the advice it gives is really good. It basically says that you maintain the level of activity, gardening activity uh, you have always had when you're pregnant, you don't escalate it. So if you haven't been mowing big, huge lawns and you suddenly start mowing big, huge lawns when you're pregnant, you're just not used to that sort of level of strenuous activity, well, then that is risky. So it has some really good advice, but just something to consider. Joan had a pretty hectic morning. Uh, she was shopping, driving, had dental work done. She was gardening. Perhaps she could have induced some kind of miscarriage. She wasn't aware that she was pregnant. This is a very interesting academic article and it talks about external causes of death after severe traumatic brain injury. And uh, it's a high quality academic study and it's very, very interesting. It talks about after you sustain a brain injury, sometimes it's not actually the brain injury that kills you. It's actually things like, you know, subsequent falls or accidents, etc. And that it's a quite a high percentage of, um, you know, these external causes, as they as they call them, can actually result in mortality. Is it conceivable that perhaps Joan did sustain a head injury, and that, uh, you know, she then, you know, endured some kind of accident? Perhaps her body was just never found. Um, there are um members of the police that felt that possibly on Route 128, she could have fallen into a, a pit that was there on the roadway. There were roadworks being done and maybe this was subsequently covered up. They didn't realise she was in there. It was quite a deep pit. Um, and we do know she was, uh, you know, there was potentially sightings of her on various routeways. I'm, I'm sort of sceptical about the sightings because I just don't know how she would have got so far from home uh, in in such a short period of time. There were sightings on two separate routeways. Um, and I think that the sightings tend to play into the idea that she had had some kind of an abortion, you know, blood running down her legs, etc. To me, I, I, I think there's something kind of malicious uh, about the sightings I, I far more uh, you know trust the sightings of some of the immediate neighbors of a vehicle in the driveway than I than I do the subsequent sightings of, of Joan of, of, of you know a, a potential Joan if you like we can't be 100% sure that it was her you know on some of these roadways so could Joan have self-harmed now, there is a phenomenon or a condition, if you like, called postpartum psychosis. It's a much more extreme version of postpartum uh, depression. It can even involve hallucinations. Um, it comes on very rapidly. The mother may have a desire to harm herself or her children. Um, I actually have um, 
a distant relative who had a daughter who was you know just living a very normal life had a baby and within a few months had thrown herself off a really tall building so you know this came on her suddenly it's called postpartum psychosis and and, and it's very very dangerous and we can see here uh, a definition from the royal college of psychiatrists uh, you know that postpartum psychosis is uh, also known as purpural psychosis it's a severe mental illness and it starts very suddenly in the days weeks etc after having a baby so i think that joan was probably outside of that um you know sort of early period after having a child having said that there are cases of postpartum psychosis that can occur even when the child is a little bit older uh, so it's just something to consider. But the obstetrician that was dealing with Joan said that Joan was a really relaxed person. She seemed very contented. He saw no signs of any kind of mental health issue, etc. So I, I don't really think that this theory uh, is a front runner, but it is discussed in some videos about Joan. So could Joan have been um, harmed by a stranger or a distant acquaintance? Well, the delivery man that day and the dry cleaning man, they were questioned by police, but they were ruled out because they had alibis. A man called Robert Foster, who worked as a purchasing agent for the Minuteman National Historical or Memorial Park, he had been calling into various houses, trying to buy back land for the park. And he had, in fact, been in Joan's house one month before she disappeared to try and buy land back for the park. Now, many women described him as outstaying his welcome. They felt his presence to be a little bit disconcerting. They felt a little uncomfortable. He didn't seem to know when to go home. Um, the police did look into him, but he had a strong alibi. He'd been meeting a supervisor when Joan disappeared and other colleagues. So they couldn't pin anything to him but he did keep showing up throughout the course of the investigation which made police feel a little bit uncomfortable my feeling is that you know foster was probably just you know somebody who was maybe a little bit bored and nosy like to sort of insert himself into situations um and, and i think that's probably the height of it there was a criminal who'd been working in a cafe in lincoln at the time joan disappeared the criminal also left town shortly after joan's disappearance the police also found pornography in the woods about 100 yards from joan's house and neighbors had heard the garage of joan's house being opened and closed in the middle of the night a few nights before she disappeared so again one wonders could you know some sort of an attacker or a sexual predator have been watching joan she was new to the area she was very beautiful um you know and this is certainly something that has to be um considered um something else that i'd like to mention is that one of the commentators uh in the video when i uploaded it the first time around they um they suggested that maybe Barbara had something to do with it. And it's a very interesting point and thank you for the comment, but I really don't believe it to be the case. I, I just think that there was a great deal of camaraderie between Barbara and Joan, even though they didn't know each other that long, there's absolutely no evidence of an affair, you know, between Joan and Barbara's husband, uh, given their proximity to each other's houses and the fact that Barbara was a stay-at-home mom, I think it would have been quite difficult to have had an affair. And I think far more evidence points to the fact that Joan was in fact happily married with Martin. Uh, Martin didn't believe in any of these theories. He always believed that Joan had an accident and maybe sustained amnesia or came to subsequent harm and her body was never found. And, and that is certainly um, you know, up there as probably one, in my opinion, of two possible theories in terms of what happened to Joan. So could Joan have faked her own disappearance? Joan was an average reader and Sarah Gerson, a reporter with the Fence Viewer Lincoln's local newspaper, would subsequently visit the town public library uh, in, in Lincoln to do some research for a story. She would discover that Joan had checked out a book, you know, about um, a, a, a mysterious disappearance and 
She would enlist some students to help her and they would check the entire bookstock and they would discover that in the summer of 1961, Joan had checked out 25 books. Some really interesting titles like the biography of Mary Queen of Scots, etc. Um, but also a lot of titles about crime and mysterious disappearances or, or um, you know, for example, there was a book called Into Thin Air about a person who staged their own disappearance and they smeared blood on a towel and on a wall, etc. So uh, this began to plant some seeds of doubt with the FBI and they actually recorded this formally that they were now beginning to wonder was was Joan actually, you know, somebody who maybe staged her own disappearance and that this now needed to be formally considered alongside the abduction theory, uh, you know, that they had um, been pursuing. But Sabine Morton and Martin, who knew Joan better than anyone, said there was absolutely no way that she would ever leave her children. It just, she was utterly devoted to her children. And I think that they know her probably better than anyone. And this is actually the most popular theory about Joan's disappearance, along with the abortion, you know, gone wrong. Um, I, I think that, you know, there was a theory that, you know, she had an abortion. It went wrong. The abortionist panicked, you know, murdered her bundled her into a car to cover up the crime or that she staged her own disappearance she, she was a restless frustrated housewife a very intellectual woman etc again I just find the stereotypes are very lazy I mean Joan knew that she would go back and become a teacher eventually I think she was at a happy point in her life and in a happy place I think that uh, her interest in disappearances um you know it may have been increased by the fact that, you know, she was going through a lot three weeks before she disappeared. She had written to her Aunt Alice, an adoptive mother, to tell her about the molestation. Um, you know, she had a lot on her plate and maybe her old life intruded on her new life. I don't think she wanted to escape her new life. She was very happily married and loved her children. I think she wanted to escape some of the pressures of the old life. She didn't want to close the door on them. She was very caring to her uh, adopted you know her adoptive brothers and sisters and adoptive mother in many ways she was almost like a mother to Alice and I think probably after Joan left home you know um, uh, Alice probably felt safer getting out of the house I'm sure that Joan protected her quite a bit and that they grouped together you know so I think that that's why she probably had an interest in disappearances but she may just have had an interest in disappearances in the way that us crime buffs you know I read a lot about disappearances and it doesn't mean anything I'd really like to thank at Grimmett one of my subscribers who suggested that perhaps she had an increased interest in this because Alice was trying to start a new life and disappear from Frank and get away from Frank and start again and I think this is an absolutely brilliant point thank you so much for the comment and apparent apologies that I actually had to delete the video and reload it because it's a really superb point so I just wanted to capture it in the video for prosperity because I think you may have actually cast light on a very significant point and maybe cleared up some misunderstanding about why she was so interested in disappearances so thank you at Grimmett and thank you for all your incredible support of this channel and your wonderful comments thank you so much so I think that's a really interesting theory and at Grimmett makes the point as well that her library borrowing record is almost like the equivalent of an internet search uh, history today so I thought that was a really cool point as well So could Joan have been harmed by somebody that she knew? Martin took two lie detector tests and he passed, plus he had been in Manhattan, so he had a very strong alibi. Frank Natras, however, had a great deal of motivation to get Joan out of the way. His wife of many decades had left him taking a daughter and a son with her. Uh, Joan had made Alice aware of the sexual abuse that she had suffered and as a result of this Alice had decided she was not going to return just when she was on the cusp of returning. Frank's sister had bailed him out financially was no longer supporting him due to ill health. Uh, Frank was very jealous of Joan, her success, her wealth, her confidence as a woman. Uh, so these are just some factors to consider. Having said that, Frank had no criminal record and also his prints didn't match the latent prints that were found uh, in Joan's house. So the only way Frank could have been involved is unless he had, you know, got a third party involved. It's not impossible, but it's certainly something to consider. Ben, however, is a little bit more uh, shady. 
because he was working as a barman in New York and his boss couldn't actually vouch that he'd been in employment, you know, or at work, should they say, the day that Joan disappeared. They kept no paper records. Something about this felt a little strange to me because usually there's some kind of even, you know, books or sort of calendar type thing where people write their, you know, shifts and roster on it just seemed a bit odd. And this same boss would also say that, you know, they didn't know where Ben was when Ben subsequently disappeared for two years. So Ben disappeared. This is Joan's adoptive brother and Frank's son. For two years after Joan disappeared, it would seem nobody could track him down, including the police. And it would seem as if Ben was possibly trying to lie low and avoid detection. We've got to remember that his fingerprints were never taken. Could he have felt really angry on behalf of his father? Ben, too, was also going through a tough time in his life. His wife was also, you know, living elsewhere with his children. She had moved to Long Island to be with her parents. These were two very disgruntled, embittered men. Could he have gone to uh, Lincoln? Maybe he went looking for money because Frank didn't have the money to go to Los Angeles to look for Alice, etc. Uh, it got out of hand. Um, when the police asked Ben had he ever visited Joan in Lincoln, he said he couldn't remember, which to me seems very odd because he did remember, he did tell the police he had visited her in her home in Connecticut. So you can see that Joan always had a door open for her family and they were not easy, even in spite of the abuse that she had suffered. We know that Frank had also been at that house in Lincoln. So, um, you know, she was a very, very kind hearted person. I think probably she found it difficult to close the door on people in her life, and nor would she have ever wanted to. She tried to be there for people. She was a good person. I think if we look at the kitchen scene, there's only two possibilities in this case, to my mind. I think a medical accident, because if a third party stranger was in the house, you're not going to suddenly start getting kitchen roll out and, um, you know, start cleaning up the scene and put the phone neatly in the bin, etc. So it could have been an accident. Joan tried to get back on keel, on an even keel, and then maybe, uh, you know, she ended up, you know, stumbling out looking for help, etc. Though we have to remember that the dog didn't pick up her scent on the roadway or going into the police dog you know, or into the woods. So to my mind, it seems far more likely that she was bundled into the back of a car. And I think that this was most likely an attack by somebody she knew. I wonder, could it have been Ben going there looking for money for him and his dad, uh, or just to kind of warn her off from telling anything else to Alice? Uh, maybe he took some of his dodgy friends. Relatives did say that Ben had a car that, you know, was really run down. It wouldn't even have taken him as far as Lincoln. And, but that could explain the motivation for having a stolen car. So, again, that's food for thought. I, I think it's one of those two possibilities. And I think the fact that Joan's scent isn't picked up on the road or going into the woods, etc. I think that we do have to look at that. It could have been an attack by somebody she knew. And Ben is certainly a suspicious character potentially in this. Of course, everybody is innocent until proven guilty. He's now passed away, has Frank. Ironically, Ben would die in a road traffic accident, given that he had previously won compensation from an insurance company for a road traffic accident, etc. But um, I think that, in, to my mind, these are the two possible contenders. Martin always felt that, you know, as I mentioned, that she could have had some sort of accident and amnesia and then maybe, you know, a secondary accident happened, etc. You know, or she was out there somewhere and she didn't know who she was and she somehow managed to start a new life. He always felt, and that is certainly not impossible. But I don't believe in the disappearance theory at all. I think, if anything, she was probably interested in people who knew how to escape their troubles, but she would never have left Martin and her children. Something that I do think of is I think that if there was, you know, a third party person who attacked Joan bundled into the back of a car, we have to remember that neighbours said they saw a dirty car in the driveway. I think it's far more likely uh, that the evidence as to who killed Joan is in the bin. Maybe the beer cans, maybe they had a drink. And that DNA could have been uploaded to uh, a DNA database and I think that that might have helped to solve the crime and it, it's probably likely that that evidence wasn't kept and uh, therefore 
you know, this crime may, or, you know, I believe it was either a crime or an accident. I don't believe it was a willing disappearance. I, I think it will never be, it will probably most likely never be solved, which is really heartbreaking, um, you know, for, for Joan's uh, descendants. One of the worst things I feel about the Joan Reach case is the victim shaming. I, I think it's one of the worst cases of victim shaming I think I've ever seen. I think Joan was a victim. Make no mistake about that. You know, her parents died in a premeditated maliciously started fire. She was a victim of sexual abuse in her childhood. And I think that the evidence in the kitchen points to some sort of an accident or an attack by somebody that she knew. But I think that all these theories have been put out there, have been propagated over the years that, you know, she was having an affair with Barbara's husband or somebody else. Um, she had an abortion that went wrong. Um, I think even the sightings of Joan were, were part of malicious gossip. You know, this woman seen along Route 128, mud pouring or blood pouring down her legs. I think it all ties into the narrative. And I think that you know, there's a lot of misogyny and a lot of chauvinism in the analysis of this case, you know, that an intellectual woman was somehow some kind of, you know, rogue, wild, bad woman, you know, just because she was educated, she had to be frustrated. She, as a, you know, as somebody caring for her children for a couple of years, you know, there's an awful lot of lazy stereotypes in the analysis of this case. And um, I think that Joan was a victim and very sadly a victim throughout her life. Um, and I think that the the uh, kitchen scene speaks to that. There was some kind of accident or I think she was attacked by somebody that she knew, possibly a family member. Maybe it could have even been Ben. We, we can't say for definite. Everybody is innocent until proven guilty. But certainly the police did look at Ben and um, Frank. And when they tried to find Ben again, he had disappeared. So. Uh, this is definitely something to consider, but I, I think that the element of victim shaming in the Joan Reach case is just awful, and it must have been excruciating for Martin and Sabine, who knew her so well, who never deviated from their position or never doubted, you know, what they knew about her, that, you know, she was most likely the victim of a, an attack or some kind of accident in which she lost her memory or came to came to harm. So this is a definition from Women Republic on victim blaming. And it says that victim blaming is a devaluing act where the victim of a crime, an accident or any type of abusive maltreatment is held as wholly or partially responsible for the wrongful conduct committed against them. And I think that we can see this with Joan. She possibly was a victim of a crime or an accident. We know that she had been a victim of abuse in her life. And yet somehow in all the analysis of Joan, she is to blame for, you know, her disappearance, you know, she planned this, she premeditated this, or she was having an affair or, you know, and it's really, really ugly. And I think there's absolutely no evidence um, for Joan having been responsible for her disappearance. I think there's far more evidence um, in the kitchen that she was a victim of an accident or of, a, or, or of an attack by somebody that she knew, maybe that palm print on the phone by the wall, they ripped out the phone as she went to get help. Um, I think there's far more evidence to point to the fact that Joan was always there for her family, always there for her friends, her children, her husband, and that if anything, her hope, her open heart may have been her undoing. She opened the door to a family member that day, welcomed them in, things turned nasty, and she didn't live to tell the tale. I think that's a far more likely uh, scenario. So I'd just like to end this video with a photograph of Joan after she won her scholarship in happier times when she won her scholarship to Wilson. Um, you know, in spite of everything that happened to her, she tried so very hard to live a happy life. It just wasn't to be. Um, and, um, you know, she was above all and even more important than her academic credentials, a really good person. Uh, the evidence when you look at this case speaks far more strongly to that than to somebody you know who wanted to leave her children it, it the there is no evidence for this is far more evidence to show that she was there for everybody in her life thank you so much for watching i really appreciate it please do like subscribe or comment the support that you've given to me um you know as i've been launching my channel has been amazing it means the absolute world to me have a wonderful weekend 
And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Dark Vanishings. All the very best.